In calculus, we need to be able to take trigonometric expressions and be able to write them in different ways that may lead to uh, an easier time of solving particular problems. Um, and we've already looked at uh, the Pythagorean identities um, earlier on and, you know, of course, looked at how we define tangent, secant, and all those um, as well. Um, but now we're going to expand um, the list of identities to know. Um, so we're going to look at addition, subtraction, and double angle identities and a few other identities that are, that are related to those. So we're going to start with the addition and subtraction formulas for sine and cosine. Um, and just looking at this list of four here, uh, you, you might already be overwhelmed. Um, there's a lot to, to look at here. Um, so to try to kind of simplify it for us, um, let me just emphasize that really all you need to do is memorize this one on top and this one on bottom. And if you do that, not only will you be able to figure out the other two formulas on this page, but you'll also be able to figure out uh, a lot of the other identities that, um, that we'll look at a little bit later. All right, so how do we memorize this one up here? Okay, so the sine of alpha plus beta, so two angles added together. So if you can just remember the little rhyme, sine, cosine, cosine, sine, then, uh, and you're placing the first angle in the first uh, trig function in each term, and then the second angle in the second trig function in each term, then just remembering sine, cosine, cosine, sine will reproduce the uh, formula for the sine of alpha plus beta for you. Similarly, you can do that for cosine as well. Um, for cosine, it's cosine, cosine, sine, sine. Okay, uh, but then you just remember to put a minus in there. Okay, so for sine of alpha plus beta, sine, cosine, cosine, sine with a plus. For cosine of alpha plus beta, it's cosine, cosine, sine, sine with a minus. So if you can just commit those two to memory, um, then these other two are just going to fall right out, and here's why. Uh, if you take the sine of alpha minus beta, then that's equal to the sine of alpha plus negative beta, of course, right? But then it just becomes the addition formula, right? So then you just write sine, cosine, cosine, sine, parentheses around this alpha here. And then you just say to yourself, okay, what happens when I take the cosine of a negative number? Well, the cosine is an even function, so the cosine of negative beta is exactly the same as the cosine of positive beta. So what I'm using there is this identity that because the cosine is an even function, Right? The cosine of the negative angle is equal to the cosine of the positive angle. Um, but then here, the sine of negative beta, right? what happens when you take the sine of the negative of an angle? Well, remember, the sine is odd, so you get the sine of their negative sine of theta, excuse me. So then this negative comes out, and so then I get minus cosine alpha sine beta. All right, and so that's, of course, this formula right here. And so it's, you can do the same thing with cosine of alpha minus beta and rederive what this ought to be um, just based upon memorizing these two. Okay, so don't memorize all four of them, these four distinct formulas that you got to keep track of. Memorize the ones with plus and then let the ones that have minus just come from the fact that minus beta is the same as plus negative beta. All right, now these formulas are, you know, perhaps strange enough that um, we should at least prove one of them just to show that they're actually plausible. Um, and so I'm going to do so using this picture right here. So notice that there are four points um, here, and I've got the distance from 
uh, the point, this is the point one zero, so this is the unit circle by the way. So this is one zero uh, right here. This is from one zero to P and the distance from Q to R should be the same, right? That they should definitely be the same because here I want an angle of beta and then I want an angle of alpha. So total I've got an angle of alpha plus beta. Um, but then what did I do is I if I go from Q to R I've gone an angle of beta in the clockwise direction so that's negative beta and then another negative alpha and so in other words this blue arc paired with this red arc is equivalent to this blue arc uh, uh, plus that red arc and so that means that these two distances must be the same so that's how we're gonna start this is just that the distance distance from uh, P to 1 0 is the same as the distance from Q to R okay and then I'll also remind us that the distance formula recall is just the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Right? That's how you get the distance between two points. So in this case between x1, y1, and x2, y2. All right. So if I know the distances are equal, if I can just uh, write down what all these points are, then I could perhaps set up the distance formula and say that the distance formula for these two is the same as the distance formula for these two. Okay. Uh, right now, all I know is one zero, though, right? Um, so let's uh, let's talk about what the point Q would have to be. Well, if all I know is the angle that I've traversed to get to point Q and this is the unit circle, then what I do know is that this is the cosine of beta as the x value and the sine of beta as the y value. Okay, the point P, well, I've gone alpha plus beta. Okay, so the x value would have to be the cosine of alpha plus beta and the y value is the sine of alpha plus beta. So there's point P. And then you kind of get the picture here. R would have to be the cosine of negative alpha, because that's the angle that I've traversed here, as the x value, and then the sine of negative alpha. So we've got all four of these points here and so I can set up the distance formula uh, for both of them. So the distance from uh, point P to 1 0 can be expressed by the square root of, I'll use brackets here, the difference in x values, so that would be the cosine of alpha plus beta minus, well the x value is 1, right? Squared. Plus the difference in y values, but that would be the sine of alpha plus beta minus 0 squared. So that would be the distance from P to the point 1, 0. But we know that that should be equal to the distance between Q and R. So let's subtract their X and Y values and square those. So this is going to be <coughs> the cosine of beta minus, 
the cosine of alpha, but let's let's just be clear here. The cosine of alpha, because the cosine is even, is really just the same, excuse me, the cosine of negative alpha is really the same as cosine of alpha because it's even. The sine of negative alpha is really just the negative sine of alpha. So to kind of clean that up over here, I'm gonna have the cosine of beta just minus the cosine of alpha squared. And then over here uh, with the y's, I'll have the sine of beta it would be minus this y value, but it's minus negative sine of alpha, so that's going to be plus sine of alpha. And then we square that. <coughs> Excuse me. So these two distances um, are equal to each other. Now, of course, I've got two square roots equal to each other, so what I can say is that the stuff inside the square roots are equal. So I'm just going to drop the square roots at this point and just work on expanding this stuff out. So on the left, it's going to be the cosine squared of alpha plus beta. And then uh, squaring this, of course, I have the outside plus the inside are both going to be negative cosine alpha plus beta. So that's negative 2 cosine alpha plus beta. And then negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. And then here, of course, I just have plus sine squared alpha plus beta. Okay. And this is all equal to this stuff expanded out. Okay. So this is going to be a little bit of a mess. Um, so here we go. It's equal to but I'm going to need more space, so here we go. It's equal to everything that I write right here. So the cosine squared beta minus 2 cosine beta cosine alpha, and then plus cosine squared cosine squared alpha, and then same thing with the signs, except the middle term is going to be positive here. So this will be sine squared beta plus 2 sine beta sine alpha, and then plus sine squared alpha. So with this big mess here, let's point out a couple of things. Uh, so first of all, I have the cosine squared of alpha plus beta. And then over here I have plus the sine squared of alpha plus beta. So we know that if we have the cosine squared plus the sine squared of the same angle, that just equals 1. Uh, I have the same thing here, cosine squared beta plus sine squared beta. Okay, Those are going to make a 1 for me. And then I also have the cosine squared of alpha plus the sine squared of alpha, that makes a 1. So all of this can clean up to, on the left side, negative 2 cosine alpha plus beta. And then we had a 1 here plus the 1 extra that we made with the Pythagorean identity, so that's plus 2. And then we look here, we had a 1 made here and a 1 made here, so that's 2. And then we had negative 2 cosine beta cosine alpha, and then plus 2 sine beta sine alpha. Okay, but you can see here that we've got plus 2 on both sides of our equation, right? So really, I can just subtract 2 from both sides here, and those 2s go away. And I also uh, have a bunch of 2s on all the remaining terms as well. So uh, this cleans up to, let's, let's go ahead and... Um, <clears throat> 
uh, just divide what we have left by negative 2. And so I have the cosine of alpha plus beta is equal to negative 2 divided by negative 2 is positive 1, of course. And just to make it match exactly the um, uh, what we have uh, in terms of the order of things in the sum formula as we stated on the previous page, uh, I'm going to put the alpha first and then the beta second. And then 2 divided by negative 2 is, of course, negative 1. So we say minus the sine of alpha times the sine of beta. So we just proved uh, that the cosine of alpha plus beta is equal to this. Um, a similar proof would work for um, the sine of alpha plus beta um, using a very similar construction, but um, not played off of 1, 0, um, played off of probably 0, 1 instead. Um, but you can see, okay, this actually comes from somewhere. It's not just falling out of the sky to us. But with that, the really the important part is remembering, okay, that those memory devices, sine of alpha plus beta, think sines, cosine, cosine, sine, and then for the cosine of alpha plus beta, cosine, cosine, sine, sine, with a minus in the middle. All right, so let's actually put the, uh, this into practice. So um, it wants us to find the exact value of the sine of 5 pi over 12. Okay, In the past, we would just look at this and say, well, that's not a special angle, so I'm just going to pull out my calculator. But with this sum formula, if I can identify 5 pi over 12 as the sum of two special angles, then I can use the sum formula to get an exact answer. So 5 pi over 12 could be 3 pi over 12 plus 2 pi over 12. But the reason uh, I want to break it into 3 pi over 12 and 2 pi over 12 is because with simplification, that becomes pi over 4 and pi over 6. And those are both special angles. So now I just remind myself the sine of alpha plus beta, I'm remembering sine, cosine, cosine, sine. All right, and then all of these are values that I know, right? I know the sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. I know the cosine of pi over 6 is root 3 over 2. I know the cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. And I know the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So with all that, we end up with root 2 times root 3 is square root of 6. 2 times 2 is 4. And then, of course, square root of 2 over 4. And so I could, I guess, put these together. So the exact answer for what the sine of 5 pi over 12 is, is root 6 plus root 2 all over 4. We can also uh, go in the opposite direction. So if I've got this expression that I want to, uh, that I want to uh, evaluate, and the angles that are involved are not special angles, well, maybe the sum or the difference of those angles are. Okay, So uh, I look at this and note, okay, here's a minus in the middle. And when I'm thinking cosine, cosine, sine, sine, that should make me think of the sum of two angles for cosine. Right? Remember, cosine is the one that if you see a minus here, it's actually the sum of the angles. So that expression is equal to the cosine of those added, but then 
when you add those together, you of course get 60 degrees. And so the cosine of 60 degrees is a half. And so you get a half here. And you probably would never have guessed that just by looking at this expression with the angles they have plugged in. All right, let's look at a little bit of a longer example here um, that can involve our, our um, sum formulas. So uh, we're told that the sine of a is 3 fifths. Um, and a is in quadrant 2. And b, the sine of b is negative 5 thirteenths, and b is in quadrant 3. So we want to find the sine of a plus b, the cosine of a plus b, and the tangent of a plus b. All right, so I know that the sine of a plus b, in order to find that, I need to both know the sine of a and the cosine of a, and the sine of b and the cosine of b. So my first task is to say it's not good enough for me just to know that the sine of a is 3 fifths. I got to figure out cosine. All right. And there's, you know, many ways you could do this, but uh, how about we just jump straight to the Pythagorean identity? So I know that the sine squared plus the cosine squared must equal 1. So 9 25ths plus the cosine squared of a. And anticipating that I'm going to be subtracting this from both sides, I'm going to go ahead and get my common denominator of 25 over 25 on the right side. So that means the cosine squared of a is equal to 16 25ths. So that must mean that the cosine of a is equal to, well, it's either plus or minus the square root of 16 25ths. Um, so which one do we choose here? Well, let's keep in mind that a is in quadrant 2, right? So if I'm sketching a quick unit circle, you know, a is somewhere over here. Okay, so the sine of a was 3 fifths, um, so it was positive, so that makes sense it's in quadrant 2, but clearly the cosine is negative over in quadrant 2, so I'm picking the negative version. So the cosine of a is negative 4 fifths, uh, because both of these are perfect squares. Okay, so that's, uh, that's good. We know the cosine of a now. Um, so now we need to do the same thing, uh, but for b. So we are told that the sine of b is negative 5 thirteenths. So same thing. Let's do the Pythagorean identity. Negative 5 thirteenths squared plus the cos squared of b is equal to 1. So that's 25 over 169 plus the cosine squared of b is equal to, again, getting my common denominator, 169 over 169. So we get the cosine squared of beta is equal to, and we end up with 144 over 169. Okay, so then the cosine of beta is e or is cosine of b, excuse me, I forgot we were just using b here. The cosine of b is plus or minus the square root of 144 over 169. And okay, the sine, uh, or the, sorry, b was in quadrant 3, right? So b is somewhere over here. Okay, and clearly the cosine is negative in quadrant 3. So I know that I'm choosing uh, the negative version here, just like I did for A. So the cosine of B is equal to negative. And again, these are perfect squares, negative 12 thirteenths. All right, so I have all of these values that I need. Um, let me just rewrite this one because that's a mess up there. Cosine of B is negative 12 thirteenths. 
thirteenths, and I'm going to rewrite this so that it's just nice and clean. All right, so I know this and this, and then of course we started off by knowing these two values for sine um, and cosine. All right, so here's our four values that we know of A and B individually, but of course we're interested in what's happening with the sine of A plus B. All right, so we go back and say, all right, let's, uh, let's remember our sum formulas here. So this is the sine of A plus B, and I'm in my mind remembering sine, cosine, cosine, sine. And when it's a plus with sine, you put plus in between those terms. So we know all of those values, right? Three-fifths times the cosine of B is negative 12 thirteenths. And then the cosine of A is negative four-fifths. And then the sine of B is negative 5 thirteenths. So negative 36 divided by, what do we get here, 65 plus 20 divided by 65, which gives me negative 16 over 65. So that gives me the sine of A plus B. And then cosine, just got to kind of go through the same motions here. But here's what I remember. When I'm adding with cosine, I'm going to put a minus in the middle for sure. And then I think to myself, cosine, cosine, sine, sine. All right, so we've got that. Uh, cosine of A. Uh, what is that? Cosine of A is negative 4 fifths. Cosine of B is negative 12 thirteenths. Minus the sine of A is 3 fifths. And then the sine of B is negative 5 thirteenths. Alright, so then that becomes 48 over 65 plus 15 over 65 and we have 50, 63 over 65. All right, so we've got our sine and our cosine and it's tempting to think that we're done here because we've taken up the entire page. Um, but there is one thing left to do, and that is that they, they did ask us what the tangent of A plus B is. Okay, but with a tangent of A plus B, if we found sine and cosine, then we're just about done. So let me kind of carve out a little, little area here. Hopefully in your notes you have a little bit more space. So if I want the tangent of A plus B, then I just need the ratio of sine to cosine. So this is negative 16 over 65 divided by 63 over 65. And then negative 16 over 65 times the reciprocal, 65 over 63. So here we have negative 16 over 63. Okay, and then the last part asks us in what quadrant does A plus B terminate? Well, we actually have all the information we need to know that now. Um, so when you look at A and B, um, you could pr you could probably kind of try to figure it out from just uh, visually there, but also if you look in what quadrant is the sine negative and the cosine positive? Well, the only quadrant that that happens in is quadrant four. So the last little piece of our, of our puzzle here is just to note that A plus B must be in 
quadrant for. So now let's move on to another uh, couple, uh, couple of formulas. Um, this time looking at uh, what happens when we take the sine or the cosine of twice an angle. Okay, so for sine we have this one formula that says that if we take the sine of twice alpha that's going to equal two times the sine of alpha times the cosine of alpha. And uh, if you recall earlier I said that memorizing the sum formula for sine and cosine will help you with lots of formulas. Well, the sum formula tells you what the formula should be for twice an angle because of course twice an angle is the same as an angle added to itself. And so I can just use the sum formula here and just remember sine cosine plus cosine sine. But of course this is just the sine of alpha times the cosine of alpha but two of them. So even if you forgot the double angle formula for sine, you could just always get it right back again as long as you know the sum formula for sine. And we can of course do the exact same thing with cosine. So the cosine of two alpha is the cosine of alpha plus alpha. And remember here we say cosine, cosine, sine, sine. And the sum formula for cosine has a minus in the middle. But of course that's just the cosine squared alpha minus the sine squared alpha. And then we are also given two other versions here. And the reason we are given two other versions is because we know that we can turn either cosine squared or sine squared into um, the other uh, trig function squared. So with the Pythagorean identity we could say this would be 1 minus the sine squared of alpha in place of cosine squared alpha and then minus the sine squared of alpha from right here which gives me 1 minus 2 sine squared alpha. And so that's what gives us this version here um, but on the other hand, we could have also said uh, that we could leave the cosine alone. And instead of sine squared, we could put 1 minus the cosine squared alpha. And we distribute the negative through, and we get cosine squared alpha minus 1 plus cosine squared alpha. And then, of course, we add those two cosine squareds and get that version there. So the cosine of 2 alpha has two formulas, or sorry, three formulas that go with it, and then the sine of 2 times our angle has just one. So let's do an example that involves uh, using the double angle formulas. So we're told that the sine of theta is negative 3 fifths and that theta is in quadrant 4. So we want to find the sine of 2 theta and the cosine of 2 theta. So let's start with the cosine. Um, and the reason I want to start with the cosine is because we have three different options for what formula to use. Since we're only given the sine here, it seems like it makes sense to use the version that uses only sine. So remember, 1 minus 2 sine squared of theta is going to give me the cosine of 2 theta. So I get 1 minus negative 3 fifths squared, oops, times 2, almost forgot. So that's 1 minus 2 times 9 25ths, which is 1 minus 18 25ths. And then get a common denominator here, 25 over 25 minus 18 over 25. And so then I get that the cosine of 2 theta is equal to 7 over 25. All right, so that's great. Uh, pretty straightforward. Didn't have to do anything too special other than just use this value that we were given for sine. Uh, however, let's understand that it, when I go to use the sine of 2 times theta, when I go to use that formula, uh, 
it has to involve both the sine and the cosine. So that means that it's not good enough for me to just know what the sine of theta is. I need to know what the cosine of theta is. So over on the side here, we'll use the Pythagorean identity. So negative 3 fifths squared plus the cosine squared of theta is equal to 1. So that's 9 25ths. Cosine squared theta is equal to 25 over 25. So we get that the cosine squared theta is 16 25ths. And then the, the cosine of theta is the either the plus or minus of the square root of 16 over 25. Uh, but since we know that the angle is in quadrant 4, and that cosine is always positive there, we're going to pick the positive version. And so cosine of theta is equal to 4 fifths. So then I can say that the sine of 2 theta is twice negative 3 fifths times 4 fifths. So 2 times negative 3 times 4 is going to give me negative 24. 5 times 5 is 25, and so there's my value for the sine of 2 theta. Okay, And uh, you know, as a double check to make sure that you uh, did all your work correctly, um, you could just make sure that the Pythagorean uh, identity holds for sine of 2 theta and cosine of 2 theta. So go ahead and convince yourself that if you took the cosine and squared it, and added that to the sine of 2 theta and squared it, that you would in fact get 1. And it, you absolutely do. Um, but that's just a quick way to make sure that you didn't make little errors um, along the way. So let's do another example here. Um, this one's kind of, again, using uh, in, in reverse here, pi over 8. Um, is not a special value, but if we recognize that this is the formula for the cosine of 2 times the angle, then all of a sudden we're taking the cosine of what is a special angle. And we know the cosine of pi over 4 is the square root of 2 over 2. All right, so let's take a look at another um, an another type of formula here. This one's called a power lowering identity. So we have the sine squared of alpha is equal to one minus the cosine of two alpha divided by two, um, and the cosine squared of alpha equals one plus the cosine of two alpha over two. Um, and this uh, just flows directly from the double angle formulas for cosine. So this one in particular comes from the version that involves only sine, which is 1 minus 2 sine squared alpha. So if you take 1 away from both sides, then you get negative 2 sine squared alpha. And then if you divide by negative 2, that gets the sine squared all by itself. And then, of course, if I uh, factor a negative out of both of these, I get 1 minus the cosine of 2 alpha divided by positive 2 if I factor a negative 1 out of the top and bottom and then let those cancel. And so that's what leads to uh, this first formula here. And then uh, it's not worth me writing out the other one, but it's the same thing. It's just using the uh, version of the double angle formula for cosine that involves only cosine. These power lowering identities are really powerful, particularly when you get into calculus 2. Um, so you'll definitely revisit them there. In this example, we're going to apply the power lowering formula to the fourth power of sine. And uh, we're going to try to express it in the end in terms of just cosines to the first 
power. So first let's remind ourselves that something raised to the fourth power is the same as squaring it and then squaring that. And the reason I want to do that is so that I can take my sine squared of x and apply the power lowering formula to it. So this becomes 1 minus the cosine of 2x all divided by 2. But then all of that is raised to the second power. And of course if I have a fraction raised to the second power I can take the numerator and denominator raised to the second power separately. And so on top, of course, I'd have to FOIL that out. So this is 1 minus 2 cosine 2x. Plus cosine squared 2x. All over 4. So I still have a second power of cosine here, and so I don't want that. Um, but these first two terms are, are just fine the way they are. So I'm just going to take this 4 as the denominator of each of these terms separately so that I can kind of deal with this one at a time. So um, this would be, I'm going to write this as 1 fourth cosine squared 2x. All right, so if I move this over here, this is 1 fourth minus, we had 2 over 4 here, so we can reduce that to 1 half. 1 half cosine of 2x. And then plus 1 quarter, and instead of the cosine squared of 2x, let's again apply the power lowering formula, but this time for cosine. So that's going to be 1 plus, now it's going to be the cosine of double the angle, but the angle that I'm doubling is 2x. So that means I put 4x here, and that's all divided by 2. So I have 1 fourth minus 1 half cosine 2x. Plus, if I distribute this through, one fourth times a half is an eighth, and then one fourth times the cosine of four x over two is going to be plus one eighth cosine four x. So I can take my one fourth, and my one eighth, put those together. Of course, I need a common denominator, so. That one fourth there is, of course, two eighths. So two eighths plus one eighth is three eighths minus one half cosine two x plus one eighth cosine four x. All right, now the half angle formula is really just the power lowering formula. Um, and I would draw your attention first of all to these uh, two on the right before we worry about the ones on the left. So understand that if we start off with theta over two, then the power lowering formula would say, okay, if you're doing sine squared of theta over two, take one minus the cosine of double that angle. Well, double theta over two is just theta. So this is literally just the power lowering formula for sine and cosine. Now, this version over here just says, well, if you don't want sine squared or cosine squared, but you just want sine or cosine, you can of course take the square root of both sides. But of course, anytime you do that, you can either have plus or minus the square root of that right side. And so of course you're just going to choose plus or minus depending upon what quadrant theta over 2 happens to be in. Now in my opinion I just like to worry about these two and and really I don't even worry about them all that much because I understand they are just the power lowering formula. But I worry about these two and then if I need to I take the square root um, 
after the fact. So I kind of just let these ones stick in my mind as opposed to worrying about the square root versions. So let's see how this half angle formula can work. So I have the sine of pi over 8. And even though pi over 8 is not a special value in the unit circle that, that we've bothered to memorize, we should recognize it as half of a special value, right? Half of pi over 4. So um, let's start off by looking at the sine squared of pi over 8. Okay. So the sine squared of pi over 8, um, if I recognize, that's the sine squared of pi over 4 divided by 2, then I can apply the half angle formula to this. All right, now I know that I ultimately don't want the sine squared, I want just the sine. Um, but again, we'll save uh, worrying about that till the end. So we know this is 1 minus the cosine of pi over 4, all divided by 2. Uh, but let's also understand that the cosine of pi over 4 is a special value, but it's square root of 2 over 2. So if I substitute root 2 over 2 in right now, I'm going to have fractions within fractions. I would rather not do that, so I'm going to pull that 2 in the denominator out and make this 1 minus the cosine of pi over 4. So now this becomes 1 half times 1 minus the square root of 2 over 2. Okay, so then that becomes 1 half minus the square root of 2 divided by 4. Okay, so there's my um, value for sine squared of pi over 8. Um, and I do kind of like the idea of combining this into just one term, so maybe I'll take one last step here and say that the sine squared of pi over 8, if I get a common denominator down here, is 2 minus the square root of 2, all divided by 4. Okay, but I did want to know the sine of pi over 8, so I'll go ahead and take the square root of both sides and I know that I'm supposed to do plus or minus right plus or minus the square root of 2 minus root 2 divided by 4 um, but remember we just look at the value of pi over 8 and ask ourselves okay is the sine positive or negative at pi over 8 well we know it's positive so I'll choose that so that means the sine of pi over 8 is equal to the square root of all this. And the 4, of course, I can take the square root of. So I can just put that this is all over 2. But in the numerator, I'll have the square root of 2 minus root 2. And that would be my exact value for the sine of pi over 8. So the last two slides here that I want to show um, give a whole bunch of formulas that I do not need you to know. Um, I'm not going to test you over any of these, but I do want you to understand that they exist, um, basically so that you understand that you can take products of sines and cosines and write them as sums. You can take sums and differences of sines and cosines and write them as products. Basically, I just want you to know that they're out there so that if you ever had the need for them, you could look them up. And then on this last slide, um, this describes how one can take the sum of a sine and a cosine and write it as just the sine of the sum of two angles. So again, I'm not going to be testing you over this, but I want you to know that this is out there and something that you can do um, um, should you ever find the need.